Welcome to the basics of dependency management at SCA featuring Endor Labs Chief Technology Officer, Dimitri Stiliadis. In this session, he will cover the basics of open source dependency management, some unique problems that come with Python, including Python-based AI applications, and he explains the inner workings of software composition analysis tools. In particular, he'll talk about how the quirks of Python mean most SCA tools do a poor job of discovering dependencies and therefore miss potential vulnerabilities. The reality is that uh, when we are trying to deal with dependency management, uh, we have two independent entities uh, that are trying to work together in order to build or run a code. Uh, the one is the package manager and the other is the, uh, the compiler or the runtime. Uh, that although they are supposed to work together, they are really operate like ships in the night uh, where they don't really know what each other is doing, right? So we have this situation of the package managers and the compilers runtimes crossing each other and uh, in, in the end creating all kinds of discrepancies. So what do I mean by that? Uh, how dependency management works is we start a project and then a developer creates a manifest file. In the manifest file, they create, they usually add the dependencies that they care about or the things that they want to import in their code. Uh, tools allow you to do that. You can do pip install and it adds it there, or you can, uh, you can do npm install or whatever and bring in the dependency and that updates the manifest file. Um, and then you have a build system uh, where it first uh, uses the package manager that uses as input this manifest file in order to download all the dependencies. And then you have a comp and the package manager will take these dependencies, download them from the internet, put them in a directory somewhere in the file system. And then you have the compiler or the runtime that it's gonna go and look in the file system, look what dependencies it finds there, and then it's going to either compile the code or execute the code based on whatever is in the file system, right? So you have the two entities, the package manager that uses the manifest file, downloads everything, the compiler uses whatever is downloaded in the file system and executes on it. But you have immediately the discrepancy here that the compiler can use anything downloaded in the file system, not just what the package manager built, brought, but pretty much anything it finds there and that the package manager can bring stuff into the file system that the compiler doesn't care about. And the package manager does not know that the compiler doesn't care about these things, right? So both of them are working independent of each other. And the way you can otherwise see that loop is that we have the developer intent. The developer intent is expressed either through a manifest file that goes to the package manager or expressed the source code of the application the manifest file is the input to the package manager in order to bring the dependencies in the file system. The source code is the input to the compiler together with the dependencies that come into the file system in order to output the program, right? That's how dependency management works in the majority of languages out there. And as I said, there is only one language where there is no essentially manifest file where the compiler creates the manifest file from the source code and downloads the dependencies from the source code, and that's in Go. And that's where Go signs as a language that ties together the package management with the compiler. Um, so how can things get out of sync, right? Uh, things can get out of sync in several ways, and they do get out of sync in day-to-day -day operations. Uh, because, for example, a developer can bring in a, a new dependency in the file system without updating the manifest file. And that's very possible to do in Python and JavaScript. Or in some cases, it's done in build systems for a very specific reasons when people have tried to operationalize things like monorepos and large-scale deployments. Um, in some cases, dependencies are there in the environment, although not explicitly brought in. For example, in Python, you might bring a dependency in because you want to run some other application in the system or some development application in the system or whatever, and then it's accessible by the code without ever referencing it in a manifest file. And the same you can do in Node and um, in JavaScript. Um, 
In some other cases, you bring in dependencies for testing and dev. A classic example is the storybook application that lots of JavaScript projects are using for design reasons, that it's not actually used for deployment. However, storybook can bring in a whole bunch of uh, transitive dependencies with it. And then the developer can actually use these transitive dependencies in the code by accident without knowing that they are not really declared. So that creates another discrepancy over here. Um, and then on the other hand, dependencies are removed from the code. They are not used anymore, but they still remain in the manifest and they create this explosion, if you want, of third-party dependencies where they are downloaded, but they are not used by anybody. They are not doing anything, right? So because, again, because of the ships in the night approach of package managers versus compilers, we end up with constant discrepancies that they are not consolidated. And, you know, you can argue these discrepancies don't create any harm. However, when you come into a production environment and you run a vulnerability scanner or whatever, they very soon create an overwhelming amount of issues uh, that need to be eventually resolved or they create false alerts, whether it's false negatives or false positives, as we will see later on. Um, and now... Now there it comes Python, and Python is where most AI applications are building. And the situation comes becomes even worse because in a lot of these Python applications, the way things work is that instead of people declaring in manifest files all the requirements that you have in order to run one of these uh, Python modules, they are very often declared in a readme file. Uh, this is an example, for example, from the OpenAI baselines repository, where it actually doesn't have a requirements.txt file to bring up all the dependencies, but it tells you, well, if you have a GPU, go and download TensorFlow this GPU. If you have a normal system without a GPU, download another version of TensorFlow, and then install and run the application, right? So in this case, what is packaged or what is needed with the application and we'll see an example of that, is that uh, it's actually manually configured with a bunch of scripts or a bunch of manual steps rather than in a manifest file, right? So it creates this huge dependency. And that's that's actually very common practice um, in, in, this, uh, in this environment. Another example I'm showing here is from Hugging Face, uh, where, it, again, there is no requirements TXT file. There is no automatic manifest. But it's a bunch of instructions, you know, pip install this and pip install that that are actually given as part of the model. Um, so what we see is that, you know, this problem becomes even more prominent, if you want, in this type of uh, not so controlled environments, and it creates even, um, even more problems. So we actually have a name for these dependencies, essentially for the set of dependencies that they are brought manually into the system. Uh, without uh, explicitly declaring them in some manifest file, uh, we are going to be referring to them as phantom dependencies, right? These are dependencies that are either provided by the system or they are downloaded through scripts or other mechanisms that we described in the previous slides. So now, um, how does source composition analysis works? Right, So we, we discussed about how package managers and compilers work together and how they create these issues of phantom dependencies. So let's look at how source composition analysis tool works. Uh, what these tools do is you give them a directory and they scan the directory and they find uh, manifest files. They find, for example, requirements.txt files. They find uh, POM XML files, whatever. They look at these files. They identify the dependencies that are declared in these files. They compare the versions of these dependencies with a database with vulnerabilities, and then they start reporting issues. So if the dependency files, the manifest files, have deviations from what actually is used in the code as we described, then what these tools are going to report, they are going to report wrong results, right? It's garbage in, garbage out in reality. And... Uh, in reality, SCA tools represent the package manager view of the world, but they don't illustrate and show issues in the code versus uh, based on the source code view of the world, right? They give you the 
the one view of the world that is often wrong rather than the other view of the world. So we end up essentially in this situation where we can have this on the left as the package management view of the world, uh, where we can have a tons of dependencies and the dependency tree here that is created by the package manager versus the compiler or runtime view of the world that is actually the only source of truth, that is actually what is really running in the system that can be a completely different tree, right? So every time we perform security operations based on the package management view of the world or the wrong view of the world, we end up with alerts. We end up with uh, tons of issues, whether it's false positives or negatives, that just don't represent reality, right? So we end up with an hallucination, if you want. So let's let's figure out now what are these issues, right? So as we said, the first issue is phantom dependencies. Essentially, there are dependencies used by the source code that are not declared in the manifest. These result in SCA tools giving us false negatives. They essentially are unable to identify issues in our application because of these dependencies. There are misused dependencies that are essentially dependencies that there are brought as test or dev dependencies that by accident are used in the runtime. Again, SCA tools dismiss these dependencies because they are test dev very often and they fail to identify issues related to them, although they are used in the runtime. Again, these are false negatives. There are other cases where dependencies that are brought in as transitive dependencies are used directly by our source code, and they are reported by the SCA tool with a potential and advice on how to fix them, but that is again wrong because the real way to fix them is by changing our source code rather than changing a transitive dependency path. And so they are lead us to unreliable fixing recommendations. And last but not least, there is the unused dependencies that they are brought by in by the package manager, but they are not used by the code. And what they result is they result essentially in false positives and noise. So this type of issues just create frustration because, hey, I have this dependence in the package manager. I'm not using it. Why are you bothering me with it? I just sent uh, some big discussion over with some Zlib dependency that happened over the weekend where there were like hundreds uh, hundreds of people who were complaining about a Zlib dependency that was actually not used, right? So that's examples of false positives or false negatives that all SCA tools are creating because they are only basing their source of truth in the manifest files and not the source code. So what is the right way to do dependency analysis? The right way to do dependency analysis is by understanding that we can only get a real representation of dependencies if we analyze the source code itself because the source code is the only source of truth in this, uh, in this exercise and not the package manager. So what does this mean? Doing dependency analysis by leveraging program analysis means that we look at the source code, we read the actual source code, we perform static analysis, and by this what I mean is we create an abstract syntax tree. We essentially create an abstraction of the source code. We follow the paths on the source code created through this abstract syntax tree. We analyze the types and the call uh, and the call flows, and we essentially create a call graph that allows us to represent what exactly is the source code calling from the dependencies that are imported. Once we have this analysis and we create this call graph, then we can figure out the exact dependencies that are used by the source code. We can correlate this with information that we find in the package manager manifests, and we can create the real representation of the dependency uh, graph, if you want, of the of the source code and the issues that are associated uh, with this dependency graph. That's the only way to produce an accurate representation of the dependencies of an application. So how do we solve that with regards to Python, for example? We go and take a Python program. We look at all the import statements. We find the first level direct dependencies that are imported by the Python code. Then we take every one of the direct dependencies imported and we recursively repeat that 
analyzing the code of the direct dependencies, finding the import statements, finding the dependencies that they are using. And we're essentially traversing all the source code tree in order to identify um, a, the real representation of, um, of the dependency graph. What this allows us to do now is it allows us to create a full dependency graph, uh, accurately represent all the dependencies and applications that are um, uh, that are read, but that are read by the source code, and then create the exact results if you want of what the, the source code is uh, is actually using. And we saw an example here where we analyze, for example, the baselines repository. Uh, with a Python program with one of the popular SCA tools. And this tool fails to, fails to discover most of the dependencies where you analyze it through source code analysis, you get the exact representation of what is used. And notice that in a lot of these cases, and the emphasis will go here in Python, the actual dependencies downloaded and used don't only depend um, about from the on the manifest, but they also depend on the target platform, right? So we can, we'll show some examples where when I run the tools in Linux, you will see a completely different set of dependencies and vulnerabilities versus when you run the same tools in Mac OS, for example, where a completely different set of dependencies and tools are brought in. Or in the example that we showed with Python baselines, where if you have a GPU, you will end up with a completely different set of dependencies than if you don't have a GPU, right? So the target system is also part of this equation and package managers are unable to identify uh, this type of issues.